question like where am I? Like why did they change it? Uh, what section are you? Technology. I think that's, that's what I asked. Yeah. And see, mine was hard because um, well, this is where we ended up last time. So I'm going to finish this stuff from. Um, let's see. I go down here. This is la the end of lecture 29. We're talking about mixture, chemical mixture. And these different kinds of diagrams where we plot different chemicals against each other in different ways. And um, in two end members, which are the two things that are being mixed. It's similar to what we talked about when we talked about S2H. So this is a diagram from White that you've seen now in the chapter if you've done the reading um, that demonstrates how the ratio of two things, two ratios, element D over element A, element P over element B, or you can think about these as isotope ratios. Um, you know, a radiogenic isotope over normalizing isotope in ratio ratio space. And what it shows you is that the shape of the mixing between them on a mixing diagram depends on a parameter called R. And R is basically the concentration contrast between the two things. Right, so R here is the concentration of the denominator element A and the denominator element B in the two end members, one and two. So it's the product over the products. So basically, important to remember that when you're looking at mixing diagrams, the concentration of the thing in the numerator doesn't matter for the shape of the curve, the concentration of the elements in the denominator. And so you can see here when R, um, you know, it's greater than one, we have an inflection that goes towards this side, and when it's less than one, an inflection towards this side, it gets more and more extreme as we go. So when you plot up data, it could be trace element ratios against each other, or like say isotope ratios. If we see an array that, that looks just qualitatively like one of these things, then we can start to hypothesize that some mixing is happening. Okay, <clears throat> this is another kind of diagram that we look at sometimes, which is a ratio versus a concentration or ratio versus the inverse concentration. It follows the same mathematics as this. It's just that um, when we don't have something in the denominator here, we just like substituting in the number one and then multiplying that out. And so it relaxes to a parabola if we're doing ratio versus concentration. In this case, we're looking at the 8786 strontium ratio. Or, or sometimes you'll see people plot up over one, one over strontium or you know, whatever the thing is, um, and then it just reduces into a mixing line. And again, what, and what's plotted on here from the textbook are the proportions in the mixture of the two end members, right? So if it's 100% A or 0% A, you're going to move along this line, right? If the only two things are mixing are A and B. So one of the ways this is really useful is when we're looking at igneous rock, I mentioned before that we're trying to disentangle a whole bunch of different processes and we start at the shallowest processes, peel them off, and then try to work our way back down into either what is the mantle made of or what were the processes that were involved in making this rock. One of the things we like to plot is crustal contamination, which happens in some places. In some places, it's difficult to tell. It's a little bit cryptic. Here, it's a little bit cryptic. Um, because we don't have a lot of variability in this. But if you go to Iceland, for instance, where the meteoric water is so um, different in oxygen isotopic composition because it's in such a high northern latitude, it's really easy to see if rock that has been interacted with rainwater has become contaminated with oxygen, somehow gets into a magma. And so, for instance, in that case, or you could take a place where we have continental crustal rocks that also have potentially very variable oxygen isotopic composition. And if we plot another parameter against them, and in this example, we're plotting 8786. And if you saw that there was a relationship between these two things that followed one of these sort of curvilinear um, relationships, then you would you know, suppose, and there are other things we could look for to sort of verify um, that there had been contamination with something in the source, uh, excuse me, with something shallow after the magma left the source. Um, and or, you know, in this particular case, they're, um, they're modeling um, a scenario where there's these kind of oxygen isotope contamination uh, in the continental crust where this particular magma is coming from. That, that's the example that, that's being done here. But you can use this example in almost any scenario. And again, these uh, two end members 
mantle and crust, crust being the contaminant, uh, different oxygen isotopic compositions, different strontium isotopic compositions. Continental crust tends to have a really high strontium isotopic composition because it was pulled off of the, um, depending on how old it is, but generally pulled off the mantle very early in a process that greatly enriches rubidium relative to strontium. And we have radiogenic growth, so we get really high numbers here. Um, the values of the volcanic rocks that we have here in Hawaii are pretty close to this, 703. It's a little bit less sometimes, a little bit more sometimes. So something that has been that has a kind of a mantle-like signature that's interacting with something that's a crustal-like signature, which in this particular case, the mantle also has an oxygen isotopic composition around six. Um, again, plus minus, depending on where you are and what's happening to that partial mantle. This stuff up here, much higher values. So this contamination pulls pulls along an array, and depending on the relative proportions of these two things and the relative concentrations, you can you know deflect downward or deflect upward, or even if the concentration contrast that ratio R is one, then you'll mix right along that the one to one line. You won't see the curvature. But it's kind of a common mistake. We see it, you know, uh, often in people just starting to do this kind of work that um, they want mixing to look like it's on a line. If it's not on a line, they say hey, it's not mixing. But, but more often than not, mixing won't be on a line. It will be on a parabola. And the reason for that is that it depends on that concentration contrast. So the next thing I kind of want to mention is that we've talked about these isotopes before as reflecting the time integrated parent-daughter ratio, right? There's a ratio that we measure in materials uh, when we're focusing on igneous rocks here that reflects how much natural, stable, non-radiogenic, non-radioactive strontium is in there. That's the 86. And 87 is a function of how much rubidium 87 is there decaying into strontium 87 and how long ago did it happen? So something with a really high rubidium strontium ratio can show a change in this ratio in a relatively short period of time. Something with a low rubidium strontium ratio, this ratio may never change, right? Because this is no uh, 87 production. So when we measure this stuff in rocks, you know, and, and as I kind of mentioned last time, and we'll talk about this a lot more coming up, um, is, is that we use variations in this qualitatively to say, oh, something that's had a high RBSR or a low RBSR ratio for a long time, and we'll talk about the families of processes that can enrich some ratios and not others and vice versa. Um, but we can't really tell when just from one isotope ratio pair, right? So we know that there's been changes in the rubidium strontium ratio of the source, but you might ask when and how. And so one of the things that we can do is compare this ratio to this ratio and look and make a prediction of is there way more variation in a suite of rocks, like for instance, Mauna Loa, um, in this than in this, right? And of course, we have to make a calculation of how much of this we would expect for different amounts of time. They're not going to be related in a one-to-one -one way because, um, you know, the rate of decay and this RBSR ratio includes all the strontium, including the other isotopes, uh, 84 and 88, for instance. And, um, but nevertheless, there, we can predict how much variation we would expect in this from this over a certain amount of time. And if we see more variation in this than that, then that's telling us something else has happened to this. If we see less variation in this than that, that's telling us that, um, you know, maybe that fractionation that produced the variation happened more recently. And you can imagine now a scenario where we've got some mantle, maybe there's just one mantle composition, maybe there's a couple that are being melted, for instance, under Hawaii, and producing magnets that are mixing. We can now disentangle using this kind of systematics. Variations of this could largely be due to the current episode of melting. What's happening today? Was it a small degree of partial melt? How small? Using the equations that we've already talked about, we could model that and predict how much variation we expect to see in this. And if we see less or more, then we can oftentimes attribute isotopic heterogeneity to long-lived features of the source, which correspond to some fraction of this being related to the source and some fraction of this being related to modern petrogenesis. So we have to use these ratios together because neither of them are 
unique. When we measure this in our rock, we get the integrated process of everything that's happened, including metal heterogeneity and all the things that happened subsequently. And especially for strontium, which is relatively high distribution coefficients in the feldspar, rocks differentiating shallow in the crust in a magma chamber where we start to pull out feldspar minerals can have this ratio change simply by the production of feldspar because the strontium gets pulled into it. This won't be affected. These are just two different isotopes of strontium. And even though that people have been looking for small variations in um, this ratio that happen when you take strontium out of the magma and put it into a feldspar to a first order, meaning like a fifth and sixth decimal place, you don't really see a variation in that process. So these ratios are useful because they see through modern petrogen. You know, again, another caveat is unless we have a shallow contamination event, as I talked about with the oxygen. So there's a bunch of things we have to check out. Okay. But so this is an assumption that we generally make. It's a good first order assumption is that when we measure isotopic composition, um, that's our ratio of two different isotopes, the same element in a law that's the same as the source it came from. We don't fractionate those things. Okay. So, um, and that's a pretty safe assumption especially for the heavier the isotope gets. We get to like uranium and lead and those things because the heavier things are, the harder it is to mass fraction. When we look at chemical ratios, it could be rubidium strontium. I've just written it generically here as A over B. We can't assume that these two things are equal unless we have this special case of invariant ratios. We talked about those previously when we looked at, for instance, the potassium uranium ratio and the difference between the crust of the moon and the earth. And the assumption is, is more like a squiggly line. It's like they're close to equal. You can still fractionate them, but they don't fractionate very much. We had some other examples about like how do we, for instance, estimate the tungsten or the molybdenum concentration in um, the early mantle. And we looked at some invariant ratios there as well. So it turns out that there aren't enough of these invariant ratios for us to sort of build up an understanding of trace element partitioning on that basis. And so instead, we do kind of what I described, which is measure the traditional trace elements that we find to be useful. And then we plot them up against each other. And sometimes we plot them up against isotope ratios. And then we start to pull out which processes at what place in the magnogenesis column is causing an effect. If we recall, we talked about lanthanum and lutetium being really potentially the lightest and heaviest for Earth's being fractionated by the presence of garnet. So if we plotted lanthanum and lutetium ratio against something else that isn't affected by garnet, and we see a lot of variation in one and not so much variation in the other, then we might, you know, rightly assume that that has something to do with mixing of melts from two different depths on the melting column, yeah, you know, garnet's ability to field or not. Or if instead we see um, a relationship where we see as much variation in both ratios, and one of them is not related to garnet, then we have to rely on something else. And there are other minerals that can fractionate those in as well, especially shallow things like aspite and dirt. So, um, like I say, there's, there are certain ratios that after a while you get used to seeing in papers, they are generally ratios involving really incompatible elements for which um, at least one of them behaves pretty, you know, pretty straightforward fashion and the other one is indicative of a particular thing, like for instance, garnet or depth of melting or climate purity or contamination or what have you. So we have this kind of suite of things. And um, they can be applied in a, you know, in a range of ways. So this, this is the most common thing where a trace element ratio in a lava doesn't equal what it was in the source, perhaps because we melted to a really, really small degree, like the rocks that the campus sits on. I think I've mentioned before, this is a really unusual silica undersaturated magma with some very extreme trace element concentrations and ratios. Because we think it came from a really small degree melt in the mantle. And the smaller you melt, the smaller the melt fraction. Obviously, the more you fractionate in compatible element ratios that we've talked about. And so I'm going to give you an example from those in a second where we can look at this and ratios like this and try and figure out, ooh, where, where did that ratio variation come from? Does the big variation in this come out of the mantle? Does it come out of how the mantle was melting? Does it come out of something that happened after the magma left the mantle and we sit in a magma chamber, et cetera, et cetera. And the kind of starting assumption, it works, I don't know, nine times out of 10, is, is that the isotope ratios depend primarily on what's happening in the mantle. This is assuming we don't have any shallow contamination that we've 
you know, for instance, from something like uh, stoking in rock that we can see with oxygen isotopes. Whereas this ratio, whatever trace element ratio we're looking at, depends on a combination of things. What's in the metal and how was the magma made, the process of petrogenesis. So we use these two things together, right? And um, with a slew of trace element ratios, along with one or two isotope ratios, we can say a lot. Doesn't mean we always come up with a single answer, but we can come up with scenarios. So here's an example of some magmas that are erupted, the orange, it's just meant to represent different proportions of mixing of two compositional end members that are kind of represented by red and yellow over here. So you could have some solid mantle that's layered, right? It's got some domains. Maybe the domains are like the size of the post building, or maybe they're smaller. Maybe they're, some of them are per, standard kind of mantle background pertussite. Some of them are peroxinitic, which are the lithologies that come from resubducting and then experiencing high pressure and then being stirred into the mantle. And those two lithologies don't melt the same, but in any event, if they're physically mixed together in a melting region, and then we get a mixed compositional melting region, which we then melt, we can get a composition. We can model this. Um, we could also have a scenario where these two things melt differently, right? One composition makes a melt, and the other composition is solid composition makes a melt. And then on the way up, they mix, right? We get a different composition depending on the relative proportion. So for instance, if we have, if this is the peridotite and this is the peroxinite and we have 90% of the mantle is this and 10% of the mantle is that, and even though this melts more what we call productively, um, we still make a lot less of this than this, right? Then we're gonna have less yellow in our orange, in our red, and we're gonna come with a kind of a composition that's more orange. We also have this scenario, which happens a lot, which is what we call chromatographic melting or chromatographic interaction of melts with the background solids, where we have a single mantle composition, it melts, it makes a composition, and then that melt percolates up through mantle of varying composition, right? And I, I've shown it here as a gradient, just because I like playing with the gradient tool, but it could also just be a sharp lithological boundary, right? And, um, and, and then again, because the melt, and think about the equations we had for uh, batch melting, right, where the melt stays with the solid as it's coming up and you get more and more and more, um, or fractional melting where we're pulling melt off and just bringing it up to the surface, this wouldn't apply there. But those intermediate dynamic melting scenarios where some amount of melt stays with the mantle and percolates up through it could encounter different compositions of mantle and re-back equilibrate with them to, again, give the hybridized melt. So we have to do modeling to figure out which one of these is happening Sometimes more than one of them is happening. And so to do that, what we usually do is use multiple isotope ratios and multiple trace element ratios, and then do some scenario testing and say, well, here's the things that we think could have happened, and here's the things we think probably didn't happen. And that's usually the gist of it in most isotope geochemistry and um, trace element geochemistry studies of, of igneous processes. And even though we don't get definitive answers, we get enough to be able to, as we'll talk about next, say stuff about the mantle and about the magma process. So um, in each of these cases, part of how we distinguish them is through that mixing parameter, right? Which is the concentration contrast of the two denominator elements that we just talked about. And, and making plots and using, and there are programs you can use for this, but you can also just do this calculation to Excel. So that was the end of last time. And as I sort of mentioned, I was gonna, um, you know, I just split the conversation uh, midstream because I knew we weren't gonna get all the way through it. So um, now let's just continue on and talk about an example of rock from Hawaii. So this is a plot of the barium lanthanum ratio, very highly incompatible element over highly incompatible element. Um, barium being an alkaline earth and lanthanum being the lightest rare earth element. And this is the 8786 strontium isotopic composition. And this is um, an early compilation of rocks from Hawaii, from Haleakala and Maui, from Kauai, and from um, Lo'ihi, Kamehua, Kanaloa. And um, you can kind of see, yeah, they kind of lay out on an array, right? An array of the tholeites, which represent a higher degree partial melt in the mantle, and they're thought to be, in the context of Hawaii at least, magnets that are formed when the volcanoes kind of move right over the plume, right? The alkalic melts tend to um, 
the best model by coming from smaller degrees partial melt, and that's thought to come at the peripheries of the plume. It's kind of like the leading edge. That's why we see a lot of, of alkalic rocks at Maliki. The other place we see alkalic rocks is at the trailing edge of volcanism at a volcano. It's just moved off of the hot spot. So Haleakala is what we call rejuvenation lava. So things that have been produced post crater formation are also alkalic, smaller degree partial melt. So what you see here is that the alkalic rocks, right, in general, have a less radiogenic strontium 8786, which is what we just talked about means a lower time and greater rubidium strontium ratio, right? We don't know when that happened, but this is almost certainly a reflection of the mixing of two different mantle lithologies in the context of our Hawaiian plume. Something is more radiogenic. It shows up in the tholeite. Tholeites, like for instance, we have here in the Koho Laos, um, and um, more alkalic rocks, which have a lower ratio. But interestingly enough, whereas normally this, which reflects a high time integrated rubidium strontium ratio, which is another ratio of more incompatible over less incompatible element. They're both incompatible. The rubidium is more incompatible than strontium. We would expect a positive correlation with this. If this was just a simply a matter of take a single bit of metal and let it age to different amounts, um, you, could, you could make these variations and then melt it and cause this variation with the melting or um, cause the sort of standard type of heterogeneity, which is um, depleted mantle and enriched mantle mixing together. We see this commonly in a lot of places. Um, both of those two processes that it melts in a way that doesn't really fracture this ratio very much would cause a positive correlation. So the fact that we have a negative correlation is kind of a big question. I go through a series of calculations here to kind of show you why this can't be from a single process. It has to be from multiple things. So it has to be an amount of mantle heterogeneity that's making this variation. And it probably has a small effect down here too, but not a gigantic effect. And whatever effect in the two mantle compositional end members that was present before melting is overprinted by the modern process of melting, which is what makes this. Okay. And what makes this variation, you have to go back a few lectures and go to look at when we talked about melting scenarios, is small, small degree partial melt. I just sort of give you that, um, that uh, sort of backbone. But so, just knowing that, knowing a little bit about the tetragenesis, we can say, oh, okay, so there's probably mixing going on here. Now, if you squint at this carefully, you might see like a slight curvature to this as we predicted from that array. I, I don't, other, other times we presented this in class students and said, yeah, I see, I see a curvature. So maybe, maybe there is, I see this pretty much a straight line with a fair amount of scatter, which means that this mixing ratio, right? Right, which is the product of the 86 abundance and the lanthanum abundance, the denominator elements in the two end members, okay? And when we're modeling, this is another kind of thing to be careful of, you get to choose your end members, right? So the, the two kind of rules about choosing end members for mixing is we never put our end members inside the array. Like you wouldn't put an end member here and here because then you can't make these compositions outside of them. They're not, so the end member has to be more extreme than these. And unless we have some good logic that says, oh yeah, one of these end members is like way over there and we're just mixing in small amounts. And sometimes we do, we have evidence for that, like contamination of country rock into a magma and we can see the country rock and we can measure it and then we can see the kind of swirly mixtures. There's some rocks I've worked in in Mexico have this, uh, where we do have, this array represents really small amounts of contamination of something with a really goofy composition, but we have no, constraints on that, then we usually pick ratios that are just like a little bit outside, right? Um, and so in a modeling exercise, what you would do is pick an end member, pick concentrations, and then just do the math. And you can do this in a spreadsheet. It's really, you know, it's very straightforward um, using those equations that we just went through and sort of plot up, yeah, how, um, how might mixing make this happen? And I've done that exercise for these, and pretty much no matter what I do, um, the best thing, the best fit, we can do a regression, the best fit is a straight line with a ratio of one uh, for this particular example. But it doesn't get us beyond the fact that we have compositional contrast in terms of ratios. It's just that the concentrations of the two end members are not all that different in the mix. Okay, so, um, you know, the next few slides kind of go through the logic of why we think that this is 
a mixture, this trend, this relationship is a mixed a mixture of processes, meaning melt, heterogeneity, and melting. This is the trajectory that you would calculate for a melting trajectory with different amounts of fractionation, um, whether it's batch melting or AFM or uh, fractional melting or dynamic melting. You're going to change this ratio and you're not going to change this ratio. Right? And, and you can model how much it takes to do this. There's like a factor of three on this ratio. That's not that hard to do with two incompatible elements. You just have to go back and look at the melt fraction diagrams. You'll see that as long as the melt fraction is, you know, are in the neighborhood of a percent, half a percent to maybe one and a half percent, this is pretty easy to do using typical distribution coefficients. And again, we don't get any fractionation there. So we know that, that we can account for some of this variation with this process, but this would have to be operating on a mantle of multiple compositions like I showed you with those yellow and red boxes just a couple of moments ago. Okay, now this is, as I kind of mentioned, this is what we would expect, right? If we had long-term heterogeneity in our mantle, some subducted material um, that's been sitting in the mantle for a half a billion or a billion years, it has high and low rubidium strontium ratios, so it grows in different values here, and high and low barium lanthanum ratios, and then we melt it a lot, um, we would expect a positive correlation, which we don't get. We get this negative correlation. So I go through some calculations here using distribution coefficients that are bulk distribution coefficients for melting. And I've made some assumptions about, you know, the relative proportions of the phases and everything else, and what the ratio of those distribution coefficients are. And so you can see here that for rubidium strontium, there's a bigger difference in distribution coefficients than there for barium lanthanum, right? All four of these elements are incompatible. But the difference between incompatibilities is greater here, right? This is, has an even lower distribution coefficient relative to this than this does relative to that. And so um, when we melt, both of these ratios should increase. And so um, one way to disentangle this variation and how much it comes out of melt is to do a corresponding plot. They didn't do it in this study, and I don't have the data to make the plot, but you can also plot rubidium strontium ratio versus barium lanthanum and see what it does. And look at the comparison between what is the slope, what is the um, amount of curvature, et cetera, et cetera, to pull out how much variation um, of this how do we expect is coming out of melting versus how much is coming out of the melt. And the long story short is, that, and like I say, I, I know I'll leave you to go, I, I go through these calculations, but I basically make two, two calculations. One is, let's just say we had one bit of mantle that we melted sometime in the past to set in some isotopic and trace element heterogeneity that the isotopic heterogeneity grows over time because we've changed the rubidium structure. So it starts out initially uniform, right? And then we take out some melt, which means we lower the rubidium strontium ratio. We end up with something that has a lower rubidium strontium ingrowth ratio, the radiogenic proportion over the same amount of time is going to change less because there's less rubidium in it, but it will still change unless there's zero rubidium, right? So the more extreme the conditions of melting you expose something to in the past, the greater the variation in trace element ratio you can make, but generally the less variation you're going to make in a lot of radiogenic isotope ratio spaces, so especially the isotope ratios where the parent is more compatible than the daughter. In the cases where the parent is more compatible than the daughter, like the Samarium neodymium system and the Lucetian Hafnium system, taking out a small amount of melt will allow us to grow in more radiogenic sources because we've left behind more of our parent and we've taken out more of our daughter, which means that over time, that daughter can grow more quickly because it started with less of it. Okay. And I, you know, I, Right? People oftentimes struggle with this, but this is why we use multiple isotope systems. The neodymium system is in the latter category. Strontium system is in the category where the parent is more compatible than the daughter. And um, you just have to kind of look at the diagrams and think through it, the stuff that we talked about last time as, as to why that's the case. We have those diagrams where we look at melting and then we uh, look at uh, evolution after the case. But so in the short answer is, is that because the way these sources vary, the um, amount of time that it would take to grow in strontium isotopic variation, if it was an ancient mantle lithology, is too long um, to be realistic. And the um, 
chemical variation that we would expect by how much, if, if we're going to make all of this variation by being a time integrated rubidium strontium variation, meaning we took some now at one point in the past, we melted it and pulled off some melt, but we had some more of that now next door or whatever that wasn't melted, and then we allowed it to grow in. Um, how much rubidium strontium variation we would get. We could calculate that by looking at the bearing lanthanum variation and comparing the two using a melting model because we know the distribution coefficient contrast and see, can we at some single point in time in the past make this variation and enough rubidium strontium variation that over time would grow into make this? And the answer is no, because they're moving in the opposite sense. If they were moving, if they were positively correlated, we could do it. But because they're negatively correlated, we can't. Which, and, and so like I said, I make the calculations here that I will leave for you. But what it ends up giving us, excuse me, is a scenario where, um, and this is calculating from the isotopes, what the difference in ratio is, and then backing it out into a um, radiogenic isotope in growth time, is, is that we can't make that array in a single stage process. We have to have mantle lithologies that have different isotopic composition, which come along with some trace element variations. Plus we have to have petrogenesis, which is further fractioning that barium lanthanum ratio. And so um, that tells us, and this is something our general thinking in a lot of hot spots, but especially here in Hawaii, our mantle plume has a primary composition plus perhaps some secondary compositions. And there's the possibility of interacting with the ambient mantle that the plume is coming up through. When the ambient mantle that the plume is coming up through is depleted mantle. Now we're going to look at some isotope compositions in various hotspot rocks, including Hawaii next. And so hopefully that aspect will become more clear. But again, this is um, these are sort of not used in a precise way to say, oh, we have this percentage of this mantle with this exact composition, but to say we know that when we see a lot of strontium isotopic composition without a lot of neodymium isotopic the composition, that there's this category of processes that can go on to make it, or vice versa. Or if we see a lot of lead isotopic variation without much strontium. So we start to compare things to each other, and we compare them to the trace elements, and people have developed this whole kind of model, what we call uh, isotopic geodynamics for the Earth, which basically says, of the things we think could be in the mantle, primitive mantle, depleted mantle, and various enriched components coming back down to this induction process, how do they evolve in time and what might their compositions be? And then try to categorize variations that we see in volcanic rocks, uh, such as here in Hawaii, as being mixtures of those things. So um, this is just, before we get to that, I just want to show you one other mixing um, example that's not doesn't involve Hawaii. This is some hot spots that exist near the East Pacific rise, um, kind of south of the equator in an area where it's the Rano Rahi Seamount Bill. It's not too far from Easter Island, where there's a ton of little seamounts and they have a bunch of compositional variability. Uh, and so this is from a, a, you know, a paper that uh, a grad student here, Linda Hall, um, wrote about um, 15 years ago where um, basically the mid-ocean ridge basalts uh, you know, erupting on the ridge right nearby, mid-ocean ridge volcanism tends to homogenize compositions more so than near ridge seamounts because we have magma chambers underneath the ridges, at least it's fast spreading ways. And so <clears throat> this is a mixing array between two end members that she's hypothesized. She picks the, the um, end members and then we have kind of a, a various things here. We have rocks that erupted on the ridge and rocks that erupted on seamount chains. And she's color coded a couple of different chains in here and then <clears throat> calculated what proportion of mix of something with a more radiogenic lead isotopic composition, meaning more uranium relative to lead. This is the one that comes from 238. This is the epsilon neodymium. Epsilon neodymium is again reflecting the Sumerian neodymium ratio over time. And then over here, we've got um, the lead medium ratio, the concentration contrast between the two elements that would make that make up these two things, right? And um, this is just another way of depicting the same medium isotopic composition and actual ratio of space. And kind of showing that she can explain the array of rocks that are observed there 
by physical mixtures with these kinds of proportions, okay? And uh, with different concentration contrasts, right? So they don't all fall along a single line. Some of them fall along the line and flex it up, and some of them fall along the line and flex it down. And you might say, well, how do we do that? And just remember that that's controlled by that parameter R, which is the changing the relative concentrations of the denominator element in both cases. And so because neodymium is less incompatible than lead, you could have a melting column where the first melts that come off of it are gonna be in a relative sense enriched in lead concentration space because it's more incompatible relative to neodymium and then subsequent melts are gonna have more of this than that, right? So if you're mixing, what, what isope ratios they carry with it is kind of immaterial for the calculation that you can make melts off a single melt column by just taking different steps of a multi-stage melting process that have different relative concentrations of the incompatible elements because of when they were taken off and what their distribution coefficients were during melting. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay, so excuse me, for the rest of the time, we're gonna talk about this sort of chemical geodynamics of the mantle. What's in the mantle? How do we know? How do we use isotopes to tell that? Et cetera, et cetera. I'm just checking the time. So we've talked about this now a lot during uh, the last few weeks. The kinds of things that we think could be in the mantle include primitive mantle, which in a lot of people's is um, diagrams is um, abbreviated PM. You'll hear, you'll hear I spoke to a chemist about PM all the time, a bulker, which is really bulk silicator, abbreviated BSE by white, because <clears throat> bulker is stuff that doesn't include what's in the core, <clears throat> generally. And so for some elements, we use this Chur or Babby model, which we talked about last time. For other elements, um, we have to make some modifications beyond that. Think about uh, lead. We had to use a slightly different model. Um, but anyway, we have ways to estimate this. And, and people, there are various people's values. And um, you know, when you're making writing a paper and you're saying, oh, I think I got from the mail or whatever here, you would say how you're defining that, and whose numbers you're using, or maybe you're defining your own numbers. There are some isotopes that are <clears throat> thought to be primordial. They are not really affected by things that happen on Earth. Helium-3 is a good example. And so oftentimes when people see rocks with a relative high proportion of helium-3 to helium-4, which is produced on Earth by decay of uranium and thorium, they would say, ah, oh, there's some primordial component in there. We know what our solar ratio is. We can compare how far off we are from that. Um, neon is another element that sometimes behaves this way. It ends up being more complicated than that. But anyway, the whole idea that there's still some primitive mantle on Earth comes from the measurement of high helium 3, 4, starting in like the 60s. And people say, oh, well, we couldn't have that if the mantle were depleted. Because depleted mantle comes from taking out a crust and when we do that, the helium would be stripped out. There shouldn't be anything left in there. <clears throat> and re-enriched metal, which is material that is subducted, I've talked about multiple times, which comes in different flavors, it shouldn't have much helium in it. In fact, people have subsequently learned that it can have helium in it, because one of the things that happens on Earth is that we get a continuous rain of very small amounts of extraterrestrial particulates that fall to Earth, you know, in very small size fraction. Obviously, meteorites fall too, but the vast majority of the mass being added to Earth is small, but it comes in this very fine part particles that have been exposed to the solar wind and they get implanted helium in them. And then that, that goes to the oceans and it ends up in the sediments. If you get some of that sediments down in the mantle, you can get some helium-3. Not a lot, but it comes with some other stuff like beryllium-10, so we can look for correlations in that as well. <clears throat> but to a first order, subducting lithosphere and putting it back in the mantle shouldn't affect the helium. We'll look at some helium patterns in a second. But where people spend most of their time in interrogating what is in the mantle, and you can imagine if you're a mantle geodynamicist, you want to know, is there any of this left and how much, is to think about how does the mantle stir over time? How viscous is it? How is heat distributed? How does that produce volcanism? And, uh, you know, people, there's different uh, mantle convection scenarios where there's kind of two layers of convection, shallow and deep. There's other people who believe the whole mantle convection. People who believe in a gradient in between. If you allow something like that to happen for four and a half billion years, um, depending on how viscous stuff is um, and how different it is in density, you can either completely stir out any heterogeneities or not, right? And so the whole fact that we find different isotopic compositions in different places 
And we know for, maybe even formed from the same family and processes, but over different periods of time, um, using the kind of arguments that we just went through, tells us that the mantle isn't completely stirred. There's various things down there. And so it's a question of, well, how many different things are down there? How many different things do we need to measure to determine it? How does that affect heat flow and heat distribution on the earth? Um, how good, because if you think about it, if there's still a bunch of um, primordial material down there, it would have all its gases with it. It would have water, it have carbon dioxide, it would have a bunch of stuff that could be added to our atmosphere versus if every bit of mantle is down there, it's been through the mill at least once, it's been up in the shallow mantle, it's been melted and whatever, and now it's either a residual thing or something that's been re-enriched by its being subtracted, then we're gonna have a very different proportion of, for instance, volatiles in the mantle. So this is a really complicated topic. And again, we're just gonna go through it kind of quickly just to give you a flavor of how this works and how um, uh, we do it. And I, I just wanna show you this, the kind of work that goes on to measure these isotopes is super time consuming. We basically have to purify, uh, we have, you know, have to pick our rocks and then chemically purify them through ion exchange processes to get down to, if we're measuring sodium isotopes, we have to have a drop of liquid, usually um, one microliter, which is a millionth of a liter, that, um, that we analyze strontium in. And that strontium can't have any rubidium in it, right? Because rubidium has an isotope that's 87, strontium has an isotope that's 87. If we're gonna measure on the mass spectrometer an 87, 86 ratio, we don't want that, that 87 having rubidium in it, right? Or it could mess us up our ratio. <clears throat> if we're measuring a neodymium isotopic composition, we can't have any other contaminant on our, um, either of our isotope ratios, but especially on our 143. Same with lead, same with everything else. It things that have the same mass, but are different chemicals, but behave similarly in the mass spectrometer are called isobars. So this is a picture of a couple of the mass spectrometers. We actually decommissioned this one a couple of years ago. We, we have a brand new one that came uh, just about three or four months ago. These are called thermal ionization mass spectrometers. They're kind of the gold standard for the way we make these measures. We take the sample, it can take weeks to get it purified and we do everything in really strong acids and in Teflon where we kind of drip through tiny little volumes, we dry stuff down, we put it into a tiny little tube that contains about one millionth of a liter and then we put little droplets. And, and if you're good at this, you can get maybe 10 droplets out. And we stick them onto a little metal wire that there's a little current that we're running through here. We're using a magnifying glass. You're sitting here, you're dropping these things in the center of the wire, you dry it on there and then it gets loaded into kind of a, a metal structure and gets stuck into here. And then we turn up the temperature on it in under vacuum and we ionize it as we thermally emit it. Okay, that's why black is called thermal ionization mass spectrometry. The ions are drawn with a really high accelerating potential, usually something like 8,000 volts or so into a magnetic field, which is a little bit hard to see the perspective of in either of these diagrams, but this is where the samples go in this mass spec, this is where they go in this mass spec. There's a curved metal tube with a, a really strong magnet. So these accelerated ions fly through a magnet. If you remember from when you had physics, the trajectory of a charged particle through a magnetic field is curved and it is proportional to the ratio of the charge to the mass. So heavier ions of the same element, you know, the various isotopes of rubidium, for instance, are going to curve less than the lighter ones. So we have a whole bunch of collectors that we can move their own little motors and we can say, oh, here's the spacing for strontium, here's the spacing for medium or whatever. We move the collectors so that each detector is, is measuring one of the isotopes. And then we'll make the measurement of the sample. And it, you know, it takes several hours per sample. We go sample, standard, sample, standard. Now there's another kind of mass spectrometer. We also have one of those um, where instead of using heat, we use a plasma, okay? Plasma like you have in the sun. We, we do it by sort of injecting the sample into a um, stream of argon gas that ex is exposed to a really high radio frequency. And it, it makes um, kind of a, a glowing plasma flame that we inject the sample right up the middle of. That it makes way more ions than this process, way more efficient. But the problem with them is they have a ton of energy squared. So this is still the gold standard because all of the ions that come off this process have a really uniform energy and they behave really nicely when they go through the magnet. But for some elements, it's really hard to ionize. Lutetium and hafnium, that system, that's one of the examples that's hard to ionize, especially because of the hafnium 
we prefer to use the plasma. Thorium, which is another one of the elements that I do a lot of, we could do it this way, but we have to have huge amounts of sample because when we stick it in here and heat it up on the wire, maybe only one part 10 to the fourth actually comes off. It's so refractory. Just think back to the, you know, which elements are refractory and which ones aren't. So the plasma is good for getting a lot of ions, but they're kind of messy. And so the mass spec is a lot bigger because we use multiple filters to try and pull out some of the sloppiness in the, um, in the ion energy spread. Because what happens is that even though we have, we're using a single accelerating voltage, as you can imagine, if a bunch of ions are kind of colliding with each other, they're trading energy and we get kind of a broader spread of energies. So when our isotopes go through the magnetic sector, because they don't all have exactly the same accelerating, uh, the energy associated with the accelerating voltage we use because of the collisions, the peaks are then overlap with each other. That's something that we call abundance sensitivity. And when we're measuring really tiny isotopes next to big isotopes, we want to make sure our peaks are separate. But so anyway, these are how these measurements are made. And it's, it's super exacting work. Tiny little things can cause contamination. Like, you know, each one of these little Teflon beakers is like a $20 item. So we reuse them, right? We clean them and we reuse them, but they start like, you can tell some of them, these are nice and clear. That was kind of cloudy. Uh, and if the person that we all kind of use each other's beakers, if the person didn't clean them, didn't clean them up good, and their samples are different than your samples, or um, the reagents that were used, and we do all this stuff in a clean room, we don't want any dust settling in there, but there's a lot of things that can mess up your samples, right? Where you, you, you go through weeks to get some stuff in process, you stick it on the wire, you get through that process. When I do this, I don't drink any coffee because you don't want to be shaking. Um, and then you stick it in here and you're like, oh man, why are my numbers all messed up, right? We had a person working in our lab about 15 years ago who was working on coral, which has a totally different 87, 86 ratio than volcanic rocks. And we set her aside with her own reagents and everything else. And somehow uh, it got contaminated within the other people. So two other people are like looking at that project. I'm like, oh, why do I have these really radiogenic strontiums in a place that shouldn't have radiogenic strontiums? It's like, huh, maybe it's because they got some coral up in there, you know? And so, um, you know, isotope geochemists kind of have a reputation for being a little bit um, kind of tense, and um, it's it, it's because the work is really exact, you know. But I, I find it fun, but not everyone finds it fun. So anyway, there's been a long kind of evolution in our ability to make these measurements. We've gotten better and better and better over time, and more and more samples and more and more labs doing it, and. Um, the very first two isotope ratios that were measured in significant quantities um, to be able to start to compare them on a ratio ratio basis with strontium and EDM. Parallel to this, lead isotope geochemistry was being developed and it has been used for tracing the male. It's now one of our gold standard elements, but in the early days, it was being used for other things, looking at the timing of formation of stuff. So, looking at the temporal component of lead more so than the compositional component. So, in the very early days of isotope geochemistry, remember, I think I mentioned last time, strontium came online as a pretty reliable method in the 60s. Neodymium came online in the 70s. So by the late 70s, there were several papers that proposed something called the mantle array, which is an inverse correlation of strontium and neodymium isotopic compositions. And for the next sort of 10 to 15 years, people thought about the mantle as everything lying along a line, right? And then maybe not even that long, maybe it was 10 years. By the mid 80s, people started to say, oh, you know, now that we've got a bunch of data. I don't really see a line here anymore. I see like kind of a fanning out. And, and so that caused people to start to think about the processes that form them. I'm going to show you what this array looks like in a second. But in the very earliest processes, uh, papers where people saw this array, they said, OK, Everything that's, that we've sampled as igneous rocks on Earth from the oceans, at least, where we don't have to worry about continental crust contamination, is a mixture between something that's depleted and something that's not depleted. And they used to think about that as a uh, primitive mantle. But we know what primitive mantle is, right? We can calculate Chur and Babi, and we can age it forward in time, because we know that we're getting strontium and sphere medium ratios. And we find compositions along the straight line that are more enriched isotopically than we would expect from Chur and Babi. So right from the start, people knew that, that this linear array could be a mixed mixture, but it had involved three things, right? And as soon as we started to get more data and the array became less linear, then we realized we need more than three things. 
So this is an early version of the male array. This is the strontium isotopic composition, more radiogenic, less radiogenic. Just to remind you, we were talking about Hawaii values a moment ago, and the least radiogenic values were here at about 0.703, and the most were here at about 0.7. And oh, by the way, that's where Hawaii is, right? Okay, so, and then this is the medium in my stock composition. Again, negative correlation because the depletion process <clears throat> lowers this ratio and raises that ratio. That's why they're negative. This star, I just put it in a different color to kind of illustrate it better, is the bulk Earth. That's the Babichur value. Right, so we already knew that mid ocean ridge basalts, and this is like from a paper you know in the 70s, um, set up here in the most depleted compositions. There's a range, but they're most depleted. Hawaii, which is an ocean island basalt, that's what OIB stands for, is kind of next. Some of these other hot spots, Kerguelen is a um, hot spot center in the Indian Ocean, uh, Ascension and Tristan da Cunha are hot spots in the South Atlantic Ocean. The Azores is a hot spot in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, you can see how these things kind of stretch out in space. And as we'll see, so, some places have, have a big array. Some places have a smaller array. And a lot of that is due to the vagaries of volcanism in that place and how compositionally complex the mantle is or whatever. But this is what the so-called mantle array looked like. And people operated under the idea that there was this array. So when I was a... Uh, undergraduate student, I was taught that there's a line, right? And then by the time I was in grad school, it's like, well, maybe there isn't a line. But it was really controversial. It took maybe another five or six years for a lot of people to accept that, oh, okay, there isn't a line, right? Um, so that by about 1990, people were talking about the things that start to deviate from the line, which we're going to look at in a second. But the other thing I kind of want you to note here is, is that, so we, sometimes you'll see Pretty much always see strontium written up as regular strontium isotopic uh, ratios. And it's just like a thing to memorize if you want to or not, if you don't. The bulk earth today is um, 0.7046. Just like I say, it's just a thing. Neodymium um, has a value for Chur. And so when we make epsilon neodymiums, we can make epsilon neodymium relative to Chur. Okay. And so that's what's plotted here. And that's, that's why, so zero, meaning it's the same as, or you can have things that have a plus epsilon neodymium relative to bulk earth. They're up here, they're the depleted compositions, depleted because when they were depleted, neodymium was pulled out more so than samarium. Samarium is the parent that leaves behind more potential for radiogenic growth than the depleted stuff. And, no, and so negative values are enriched. And this has always bugged me, you know, just like on a personal level, like, ah, I don't want something to be negative that's enriched. I want it to be, have a positive number. But they didn't ask me when, you know, they defined us that parameter. I would have somehow done it in a way that, you know, made positive uh, and negative the opposite. So these values for enriched and depleted um, are not really disputed at all. The range of values, Again, in the early days, there were some not so good measurements also. that All that stuff's been cleared out uh, for a long time. <clears throat> this slide just explains how epsilon neodymium is calculated. And um, it's kind of shown here, the measurement value in a sample relative to what's measured in chondrite, okay, and times 10 to the 4. And um, just like we do for oxygenized stuff compositions, which are done in per mil units, these are in per tenth of a mil or per 10,000 units. And just like with oxygen, where we compare it to SMO or PDP, here we're comparing to something called the chondrite average. And there are standards. The current standard comes from Japan that most people use. Um, it's got a value that's really close to chondrite. It's not exactly chondritic, but anyway, we know what the offset factor is. And so you use the standard for a couple of things. You use it to, on your mass spectrometer, you keep making a bunch of measurements and you make sure you get the right number. Because there's things that happen in the mass spec that can fraction with these things that we got to correct out. You use it to compare yourself to other labs. You run the standard through your chemistry to make sure there's no sources of contamination and you're somehow like messing up your numbers in the lab. And, um, and then we normalize to it. And so we get isotopic compositions that in the old days, sometimes people would only report this in their paper, which in modern data practice we consider bad because it's a derived parameter. You would rather have them give them us this and this, 
Because let's say someone, and it has happened, someone publishes a paper 10 years later and says, hey, you know what? I've reevaluated the isotopic composition of the standard that you're all using, and I think it's this other number. And if you want to go back and change it for that, in the case of the, the stuff I work on, um, the half-lives have been changed a little bit over time. And if I and I use multiply half-lives times element ratios to calculate, or isotope ratios to calculate um, isotope ratios in radiation space, um, I can't undo that calculation if I don't know what the half-life was. So there's you know a lot of little details that go into this this kind of thing. So um, that metal array, as was originally described, has now been thought of more like a fan, a fanning out of compositions. I'll show you a plot in a second. The depleted end hasn't really changed that much. The part up here. But what happens is we get farther and farther along here. We see some compositions shooting out this way, some compositions shooting down this way, and so we think of them as a family of processes. There's definitely the depletion and um, enrichment processes. And we think about the depletion, right? The extraction of melts to make crust, making depletion didn't all have to happen at one time. So it's possible that this range of variation from here down to here represents a couple of different things. One is how depleted was the mantle when it was formed? And the other is how long ago did it happen, right? The longer ago it happened, for the same chemical separation of rubidium from strontium and strontium from we're going to uh, you know, look farther down in this direction than if it happened recently. There's also the possibility, of course, that um, we have one single composition and we're just adding in different amounts of something like this back to it, right? Uh, and again, this is why that mixing discussion that, that we just had is kind of important because we can make predictions on what, on what we expect. But the stuff that sits here at more radiogenic strontium and less radiogenic medium than Olger, Chur, Babi have to come from something else, right? And this is where the array fans. It's not just one something else, it's multiple something else. Okay, so this is like a more updated version of that mantle array. What we were looking at before is just this part of the diagram up to about here, 0 0.706. But when you pull it out and you look at some other places, okay, and uh, you find some compositions that are like way off the array, right? So we have some things that sit below the array, some things that sit um, in a space here. This is this is the bulk earth again, where um, they're really depleted in strontium, but they're enriched in neodymium. In, in remember, enriched is negative numbers. Um, and we also have places that are really radiogenic in strontium. But don't show much variation in the identity. And if you look at some of these places, you'll see, you know, these are volcanic rocks in Italy, in this particular example, arc rocks that erupted through continental crust. The continental crust causes some contamination. Old continental crust tends to be very radiogenic. And so you don't have to mix very much of that in. Um, you know, Mount Vesuvius is famous because uh, there are carbonate lithologies around where the magma chamber is. And so if you take magma and you bring it off the metal and you interact it with some rock as carbonate, which is again, full of strontium, you could suck in some strontium rich juices and cause a shallow process to give you deviation here. So we're not 100% certain that all the variations in these diet, in this particular diagram, um, come out of the metal. Some of them may come subsequent and there are ways of, of looking that up or trying to sort that out. But in any event, um, this um, was kind of an early paper, kind of example of, hey, you know what? There are compositions that don't conform to this array. And so you can divide up this diagram into four quadrants, right? Where we've got the uh, bulk earth in the middle, and then we've got places that are depleted in rubidium and strontium, places that are um, whatever, enriched in strontium and depleted in medium. And in fact, there's no nothing in this quadrant. That doesn't, we don't seem to have that, at least we haven't found many of those. Uh, and then places that are enriched in neodymium, but not uh, enriched in strontium, meaning depleted in strontium, and places that are enriched in both, but in ways that deviate from a simple one. Okay. And so in this formalization, you can calculate how far are you from the array or from this place using factors, fractionation factors, that compare the parent-daughter ratio to the um, value that it is in sure. So now we're not talking about the isotope ratio, we're talking about the parent-daughter ratios. 
calculate how far from the array uh, we are and then figure out either is that a function of time or compositional process that caused that deviation and trade those two things off from each other for any given place to say, ah, okay, we think we have an ancient heterogeneity here. The reason it's off, you know, the array is because of involvement in carbon sediments or something like that. Um, and it, but even with just one diagram like this, it's hard to disentangle the many processes that could happen. So instead, we start to look at other isotopic systems as well. Other isotopic systems which have slightly different chemistry and different half-lives. And then we can start to say, well, okay, putting all this stuff together, here's what we think is happening. So here's a couple of other isotope arrays. So we were just looking at the epsilon neodymium versus strontium. This is epsilon hafnium versus strontium. Hafnium comes with the TCM hafnium system. This is how it is plotted up. Just like neodymium, we make a comparison to CHIRP. We plot it in epsilon units with the units of 10 to the fourth. So it behaves the same way as neodymium in the sense that positive values are depleted, enriched values are negative. And we see sort of the same thing. Um, we, we don't even, we don't even, people don't talk about, by the time people started really publishing Hafnium, which is the 90s, we weren't really talking about the mantle array anymore. But it'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find a line through here. You can already really see a bunch of things. These are just different um, volcanoes um, and, or volcanic terrains in the different fields. And then over here, we have epsilon neodymium plotted versus epsilon hafnium. Now that's a positive correlation because in both cases, the parent is less incompatible than the daughter. So we have more radiogenic ingrowth in our depleted uh, mantle sources. And so of all the various systems, this neodymium versus hafnium is the most well behaved to a fairly linear array, okay? Which tells us something because the half-life of the two progenitor uh, isotopes are different. And if there was a big range in time, then even if the compositions um, you know, would tell us that we predict a really simple relationship, different amounts of time for ingrowth could still cause some pain in the app. Okay. Now, when you look in detail, people have said, oh, you know, there's a, you know, a population of samples that are slightly higher and slightly lower, and these are geographically distributed on the planet. And maybe they talk about different mammal domains being formed at different times. Et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's true. Um, it's possible, but it's a level of complexity that we're not going to really talk about too much. The other thing that I do want to point out is that because depleted sources experience more radiogenic ingrowth in the neodymium and the um, hafnium system, this system is really good for looking at depleted compositions and chemical variations in the depleted mound in mid-ocean ridge basalt, for instance. So people like to sort of say, oh, it's all one thing, but it isn't. You can have different amounts of depletion, right? The process of taking melts doesn't always strip out exactly the same amount of melt and leave a residue of exactly the same composition. Another place where depleted mantle that's really important is at uh, subduction zone volcanoes where melts are percolating up through this very depleted mantle wedge. And so we use the neodymium and the hafnium isotopes. And so you can see a lot more variation here than you see on this end of the array because it's sensitive to that. Whereas strontium, and as we'll talk about in a moment, lead are more sensitive to the enrichment side of things relative to stern value and not so much variation in the ocean rich results. And the fact that strontium was one of the very first things that came out is part of the reason why um, you know people had this idea that maybe the depleted metal was like a single composition pretty much ever on the planet because it didn't show much strontium isotopic variability. So this slide just kind of explains, um, you know, some of what I just went through, the difference in the half-lives and the relative amount of variation you can deduce from hafnium and neodymium. Remember, we said that both of these things are the ratio relative to Fabi or Chur. It's actually Chur in both these types of cases. So bulk are um, times 10 to the fourth. So see here now, neodymium is varying by like 0, 4, 8, 12, Whereas this guy is varying by like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. This one varies by more. Hafnium varies by more than the neodymium. The reason for that is that there's a bigger variation in distribution coefficients between the TCM and hafnium than there is between samarium and neodymium. Right? And again, if you just think about it, samarium and neodymium are sitting really close together here in the rare earth. The TCM and hafnium, hafnium is over here, TCM is all the way over there. More variation. And 
we wouldn't see that reflected in the isotope ratios if these sources hadn't been sitting around for a long time, right? If we had just fractionated the TCM and hafnium and then took some more magma off of it, we're not going to see a variation in this ratio from it. It takes time to have reached anything. So it tells us that the, the lot, at least of these compositions, are ancient and, um, and to some extent correlated across isotope systems, and they behave in ways that are predictable from the geochemistry. So here are some other diagrams. Um, and um, part of the sort of first, one of the first papers that described the so called mantle zoo. Okay. And you can see here, there's a couple of papers that are sort of summarizing here, but this is the work of Bill White. He was one of the early people on this, not the only one. Um, and looking at now, so this is Steinberg and Nagimian, right? And um, this is strontium versus lead. And this is the uranium-based lead, uranium 238, 206 versus lead 204. And this is two different ratios of lead. 207, 204, that comes from the uranium 235, and 206, 204. So this one here is, a, is basically like plotting uranium lead ratio versus uranium lead. This one has a shorter half-life than this one. And so as we talked about last time, you can tell about reservoirs that were depleted in the distant past versus the modern past. Okay, so now you see that um, the motor array, and, and one other kind of historical note, there's no hafnium in these papers because people weren't measuring hafnium in the 80s when this was uh, being done. Not much. Anymore. So um, there's some end members. I put a little yellow dot to show depleted mantle estimates. Um, something called high mu, which is a material with a high uranium lead, as we talked about last time briefly. Mu directly correlates with this thing, but in a less direct way, it also correlates with that. Okay, and so you can see, and then EM, which stands for enriched mantle. Now, many people refer to EM1 and EM2. I feel like they consider them as an array of enriched compositions. So this is what they say. Um, the, up here on this diagram, the primitive mantle is up there. Excuse me, the primitive mantle is there. Um, high mu is there. The primitive mantle is not shown on these diagrams, but it would be roughly around here. Remember, 7046 for the strontium, so it's more like here. Okay, if we look in strontium lead space, we see kind of a really complicated fanning where between depleted mantle and this type of enriched mantle, things mix in this direction and not much mixing in this direction. And then we have these other specific places, including Hawaii, Kerguela, and the Society Islands that kind of mix upward off of this array with a lot of strong variation and not much lead variation. All right. And so, and then down here in lead, lead space, um, if this were all formed at a single point in time, we would expect these to be very well correlated because they both come from the uranium lead ratio. But if we just take stuff off the mantle at different periods of time where we set in their isotopic composition through ingrowth, subsequent ingrowth, then we get a fanning, right? Because things that happened a long time ago are going to show more variation in this because they were taken off back when uranium 235, there was still a lot more of it. So this is just one of those diagrams sort of blown up. This is the lead lead diagram. Um, you know, 207, 204, 206, 204. And what we can see on here is a few things, right? We can see that there's a linear mixing array between something that looks kind of like the you know, depleted mantle, something, here's where the primitive mantle plots, and this high mu component, and some things are pulled off of that array to these enriched components. And so the long and short of all of these things is that this, whereas the family of processes that make depleted mantle, there, there, there are multiple of them, and they can make slightly different variations. In most situations, we don't see a ton of variation here, um, unless we're looking at uh, half an isotope space. But what we see is kind of two things. One thing that um, changes uranium lead ratio, and you know, along with some of the other ratios, where it changes uranium lead a lot, but not the other ratios a lot. Um, and then things that change um, this ratio a lot and not this one a lot, or change strontium a lot and not this one a lot. So high mu is something with a high time integrated uranium lead ratio, and things that deviate from this line most likely deviated because their source chemistry was imparted earlier in Earth's history when there was still some 235. Or 
um, it, or by something that's been reintroduced into the mantle that has those characteristics. So again, this is the 87, 86 diagram. It's just blown up from before. And, and just to remind you of this fanning out, the, the fanning out of these compositions happens not from this high mu composition. The materials that have the most high mu-ish isotopic composition in lead space, in neodymium and in storm space, they're kind of mediocre. They look not too far off from primitive mantle. The things that cause the fanning in this case are different places and different um, uh, isotope ratios. So um, it's, it's, that's why we plot these things against each other. And here's 87 versus lead. This one's maybe the most instructive because it shows us where depleted mantle, high mu, um, bulker, uh, right, I said bulker is labeled as primitive male, and then these kind of positively moving up arrays to a family of enriched compositions. So one of the things that um, people can look at then is, okay, well, so how do these compositions vary in different places um, in terms of um, the range in the values? So these are just some histograms showing you that some uh, types of rocks have more variation than others. Arc basalts have the most. Ocean basalts have the next most, morphs have the least. And so we use these different places to because they form from different processes to constrain the different uh, things that are happening. And um, this is what's called the mantle tetrahedron, um, introduced um, by Zindler when he was a grad student um, in Hart, um, where they, instead of plotting isotopes versus each other directly, these are plotted in um, four, a three, the four dimensional space that's somehow superimposed on two-dimensional space where the estimates for the compositional end members now for GMM, high mu, EM1, and EM2 are plotted in um, <clears throat> an oblique diagram that's really looking at the strontium, neodymium, and lead isotope compositions um, in a projection and looking at sort of where stuff plots up on this. And what you can see is, is that um, many hot spots from these long linear arrays that mix between something that's sort of depleted and something that's either EM1 or EM2. So all these things here kind of correspond to um, these things. There's just more data on that. That's a more modern plot. But each one of these arrays going up to a family of EM compositions basically correspond to a lot of variation in lead and strontium and not as much variation in museum. These guys over here tend to be the things that um, look like these guys over here. The things that are going more towards the high mu composition. We had a lot of lead isotopic variation and not so much strontium and neodymium variation. And the, the sort of final thing that I want to mention about this is what super controversial and not generally agreed on is that uh, maybe all of these arrays point to something down here on this bottom axis that some people call FOSO for focus zone. Some people call it C for the common composition. Various people have debated this and who said it first and whatever. And I'm not even sure that I believe in it, but uh, like most of these arrays just point over to here, in my opinion, um, not down to this line. But in any event, some people argue that that might be the bulk composition of the male. That everything that we see is a mixture of multiple things, depleted stuff, stuff that's been enriched in the processes that make EM1 and EM2, which are thought to be related to subduction, it's stuff that's related that's enriched in stuff that's related to high mu, which is also subduction, but something with a high uranium lead ratio like carbonate sediment. And that all of those little flavors are flavoring a background male composition with this composition. Um, and like I say, I personally don't ascribe to this. I, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't some stuff down there, but I just don't think it's mathematically well enough to describe. So there's a few more slides in here that just talk about um, kind of how you make all this stuff in the context of a mail, and we obviously don't have time to talk about today, but if you want to read them, um, you know, you, you can just think, you can think about this in your own um, head, that there's processes and there's time, and these things superimposed together to leave an imprint on the mail. We can see it when we measure it in these rocks. So sorry for going a little bit long.